just try to be close to the camera. Oh, close to the camera, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Will, I'm gonna be speaking about how we are scaling Diversify uh, to uh, handle thousands of transactions at low cost using zero knowledge proofs. Um, and I'm gonna be going through in particular what Diversify is, why we're using zero knowledge proofs and how they're working to help us scale uh, a decentralized exchange. So, uh, decentralized exchange can mean a few, a few different things. What we're meaning in particular is that we're not holding um, customer assets. They're always in control of their own funds. And um, in particular, what we're offering to a customer is high-speed, trust-free trading, which has security guaranteed by Ethereum public mainnet. So just some background on Diversify. We've actually had our current platform live now for 18 months, um, originally under known as FNX Trustless. And the stage we're at now is um, on mainnet, we're still using 0x protocol for settlements, where every single trade gets settled. But we're upgrading and have just released onto the Wopston network um, a version of the platform which instead uses a zero knowledge proof, um, which it submits to the blockchain to settle thousands of transactions at the same time, which means that our costs become much, much lower. And our throughput goes from the potential to do four trades per second settled to up to 9,000 per second, um, which is far beyond anything which we think is gonna be necessary for exchange in the very uh, sort of medium to long term. And um, I'm gonna speak about initially the problem with exchanges, so not just centralized exchanges, but also now um, other, de other decentralized exchanges and DeFi, which is becoming like a, a real part of the trading ecosystem quite quickly in the last six months. Um, how zero knowledge proofs work, and then in particular, how Diversify uses them to um, take our platform in to um, really solve a problem which we think is new. Um, and then in finally talk about the remaining issues that we still see, which even um, with our sort of new uh, design, we don't think are quite yet solved, but the things that we're really focusing on to um, to bring together the worlds of DeFi with composability and um, adding all these apps together and high speeds, uh, scalable exchange. Um, let's have a look at that. So first of all, um, who, who is actually trading crypto these days? Um, we, we've kind of condensed it into three, three audiences. So we have enthusiastic Evan. He absolutely loves DeFi. You know, he, he was telling people Ethereum was cool before, um, before it was even in uh, the news. And he loves rainbows, he loves unicorns. He wants to be able to interact uh, with everything using MetaMask, but he doesn't actually trade very often or very large amounts. We have day trader Dave, who actually now is making, was trying to make money tra trading every single day. Um, he, he has his charts up and he considers himself a professional trader. He may even have experience outside of crypto. And then we have Algorithmic Alice, who is, is, a, is, is trading via API, high speed, high frequency, um, and has been making a lot of money uh, in all sorts of ways. And enthusiastic Evan is actually pretty happy now. Um, so he's using Lego DeFi apps. He's doing it all from his private wallet. Um, he's able to borrow DAI on his Ethereum collateral, trade it instantly or instantly as far as he's concerned on Uniswap or wherever else and turn it into whatever tokens he wants. And he's having a lot of fun. And by the way, this is bloody cool. You know, he's never, this is, this is mind blowing new concepts every few weeks. Um, he's very happy with his experience. And it's, and it's relatively simple to use. And actually, on the other end, Algorithmic Alice is relatively happy. Um, they're using centralized major exchanges, very high-speed APIs. Most of the time, they may even be able to get credit lines and special access, which means that they don't have many funds at risk on these platforms. Um, and they get customer support, which means they have someone to blame if something goes wrong. And they can call them up, and they can get very angry. Um, and they're pretty happy with their solution, too. Now, there are, of course, some downsides for both of them. So using DeFi 
there's slow, pri slow price discovery. So the fact that you have to submit a transaction on chain means that these prices are not updating as fast as they would be on a centralized platform. You have quite high transaction costs, which reduces the profits you're able to make on these trades and mean that your prices is, is on average worse. And you don't have any privacy. So if you did have like a very proprietary trading strategy, you're going to be losing out to people who might be front running you, including miners. And actually, Algorithmic Alice also has some problems. The fact that they don't necessarily have full control over their funds, and there is some exchange risk depending on which venues they're using. But both of them can look can look past both can look past these issues because they're they're overall pretty happy with what they're getting. On the other hand, day trader Dave, who wants to be trading all day long on his um, trading screens and accessing the best market prices and trying to make money on his own strategies, but doesn't probably have the weight that Algorithmic Alice does. Um, to be able to get special access to the exchange is not very happy because they're still carrying the risk, they're still waiting for their long withdrawals on centralized exchanges, but can't yet use DeFi because um, it's too slow and, and not good enough prices for them to run uh, their strategies. And so we wanted to build something for, for Dave uh, and make him happy. And so Diversify and the product we've, we're just about to relaunch with Zero Knowledge Proof Settlement is aimed at him. And in particular, what we're offering is fast off-chain trading with low cost and private settlement on the main chain Ethereum blockchain. And it's all cryptographically secured, although not every single atomic transaction needs to go on chain and be paid for. And so we're doing that using zero knowledge proofs. And I'm going to give a quick overview of how these work and how in particular they're used for scaling. So um, with a, a zero knowledge proof is a particular type of cryptographic proof where we can define a predicate which can be any um, generalized function where we can then take some information um, and give it to a prover who will check that it meets the requirements in that predicate and can, create, can generate a proof which is given to a verifier who simply has to confirm true or false uh, as to whether or not uh, the proof um, was valid. And so that can be used for a lot of different things. Um, but in particular, uh, this, this, one is, this, this set of proofs is defined as zero knowledge because the verifier doesn't need to see either the inputs or the outputs in order to verify that it's true. And that can obviously have a lot of impacts for privacy. So you know, the simplest example would be that I have two numbers, x and y, and we can prove that summing them gives Z, but I don't need to reveal X, Y, or Z to the verifier for them to know that I had a valid set of numbers. And that's um, the, the primary use, the, the, the first use case of zero knowledge proofs for privacy and exemplified by Zcash with shielded, shielded transactions where I could send uh, my uh, Zcash to anyone here um, without revealing uh, to the public who I'm sending it to, how much, uh, and that I had a valid balance, but all of that is, va is verified to be true. But the second set of properties that these proofs have, which is interesting for us with scaling, um, is that the size of the proof, first of all, um, grows uh, log base two with the number of transactions that we're including. So although there's a fixed, that there's a certain cost that's required for each proof that we're submitting onto the blockchain, we can actually put thousands of transactions into the same proof and, generating some, and generate something which isn't much larger than a proof for a small number of transactions, which means that when we come to submit it to the blockchain to verify, um, the size of the data is relatively small and the gas cost that we need to pay is also much smaller than it would have been to submit each of those um, deposit, so each of those transactions um, on their own. Um, and what this allows us to do, therefore, is to batch together thousands of trades over a certain time period and have them confirmed all, all at one time in a um, single transaction. So in particular, for Diversify, uh, we're using Starks. So it's a particular set of zero knowledge uh, proofs. Um, it has some, some nice features, one of which is that unlike some other types of um, proof, they don't require a trusted setup, which means that um, they can, it, we have a guarantee that uh, there's no complications around when you're setting this all up. Certain people have to follow a um, very careful um, process to ensure that there's no leakage of any privacy information, um, which could later undermine the system. Um, we're able to achieve, and this is already tested on Wopston Test Network. This is not theoretical. Um, batches, batch settlements of up to 9,000 trades. 
per second, and that's, which is much more than what we'd need right now. But the interesting characteristic is that the gas per batch <coughs> tends to be in the range of just under 4 million gas up to about 5 million gas. Um, and that's basically at the lower end, 4 million is when you're doing quite a small number of transactions. 5 million is when you're doing up to 9,000. Uh, sorry, actually 64,000 in one batch, but over a period of seconds. Um, and the cost for that is around $5. So what we can say is that actually right now, if you're able to do 50 transactions in one batch, it's already, it already becomes cheaper than settling each of them individually onto the blockchain, um, which is quite a low threshold, although you know, particularly if you wanted to only do one batch an hour, you only need one transaction per minute for it to become cost effective to do this type of um, scaling. And at very high numbers of trades, your cost becomes extremely low, you know, less than one cent per trade, um, which is already sort of uh, 50, 20 or 30 orders of magnitude better than on mainnet Ethereum. So um, in practice, the way that this looks um, is that you have an off-chain prover who um, takes in, uh, a bit basically balances data, um, which is no longer stored on-chain, and submits it to a verifier smart contract on-chain. Um, so in a typical... Uh, Dex, you would have a single smart contract which holds all the funds. Um, and this contract also holds the balances of all customers. So for every uh, person who uses it, you have some data which is storing how much of each token you have and your um, address. And each time there's a trade, you'll be updating this smart contract, which costs some gas and requires some data to store the new update. Um, but here, instead, we've basically removed all user balances from this contract. And all that you're storing here, up post a deposit, is um, the uh, basically root of this Merkle tree of balances. And so um, all we need to do is each time there's a set of updates, submit a proof to the verifier contract, which updates that root. And so the amount of data which you actually have on chain is very, very small and doesn't scale with the number of transactions. So if we now look at this in the kind of production system, DayTrader Dave comes to Diversify, um, and they have a key which they use to sign all operations that they want to perform, such as a trade. This key actually is separate from uh, their Ethereum key. So this is a trading key, and, that, and that's, um, this, this one's using a slightly different curve, which is optimized for Stark proofs. Um, the, benefit, the, other, the additional benefit over this is that it means that your actual funds could be held with a multi-sig wallet. They could be held in Ledger, for example, which is one of the um, hardware wallets that's supported from the start. But when you end up trading, you could have a separate key controlled on, for example, uh, like a, a cloud-based machine, which it has a lower security profile because it could be compromised. Um, and that would allow, for example, a, trader to, a hacker to trade on your behalf, but they could never withdraw your funds. So you'd sign with this key send it to a diversify, and from the, from the user's experience, it would seem pretty much like a centralized trading experience at this point, so that instant balance updates, um, very fast moving order book, um, and instant confirmation of execution of trades. But once diversify finds a matched trade, it sends it to uh, the Starkware prover system, which is then going to collect enough of these trades over a period of time, and eventually generate a new proof which gets submitted to the verifier smart contract to update the root on chain. Um, so for um, like a specific action, for example, deposits, here we're using um, both the transaction on chain. So the first step would be for Dave to generate a, a new deposit to the smart contract. At this point, the smart contract actually does hold his on uh, record his balance on chain temporarily. So this is the only point where we uh, have a storage operation on chain. Um, and we detect, first of all, uh, I don't know if this, uh, we detect, first of all, um, an event emitted by that smart contract, which is the deposit, and also wait for Dave to send us um, a transfer uh, process. So um, once we receive both of these uh, pieces of information. We can submit both of them to the prover, which again then generates a proof, submits it to the smart contract, and clears Dave's balance from the smart contract, um, me and meaning that his balance is now only recorded off-chain, and again, reducing the amount of data on-chain. 
Um, so all of that was how things look in normal operation, um, which essentially means there's very little interaction with the smart contract and very little data stored. Um, the exception to that is if Diversify goes offline. So although we can never um, in any way cause a, a movement of funds that wasn't initiated by the user and signed cryptographically by them, um, what we could do is censor users or completely go offline in the worst case. Um, and in that scenario, um, Dave has basically a, a, re a recourse that he can take, which is that he can request from the smart contract on-chain a withdrawal of what, his, what he believes his balance is to be. Um, and if we were, for example, temporarily offline and come back on, we were able to submit a withdrawal through the normal process and trigger his funds to get sent back to him. But uh, if we didn't respond to that within a certain amount of time, this initiates a new um, process on the smart contract, which essentially freezes the current state and means that we can no longer update that route of all the balances. Um, and instead means that the only operation that can be performed on this smart contract is a withdrawal of everyone's funds. Um, so in order to then, once reaching this state, withdraw his funds, Dave needs to submit his balance data to the smart contract um, and can then um, withdraw, back to, withdraw back to his uh, wallet. The only additional complication to this is that um, in order to be able to do that withdrawal, Dave does need to know his own balance. And if, for example, um, he hadn't recorded that and didn't have that information available or the exchange had made an effort to hide it from him, um, he would need to be able to get it from somewhere else. And so we've had to take a design decision here, uh, and I think this is one where we'll continue to iterate around um, the benefit of privacy for these traders versus the ability to withdraw in this disaster scenario. Um, and we've done that through um, creating um, a data availability committee. So our aims were to ensure that data is always available to withdraw um, if we were to go completely offline and um, also to preserve privacy under normal operating circumstances for all traders to ensure that they can deploy, for example, proprietary trading strategies and trade at very high frequency with these without worrying about being front run or having their strategies stolen. And so um, what we're going to be using on, uh, during the initial launch in around um, a month's time on mainnet will be this committee of around um, six or seven mm -hmm. uh, members, two of which will be Starkware and Diversify, um, who hold backups of this data. And each time we update onto the smart contract a new route, um, they're required to also sign it to confirm uh, and validate that they are holding a copy of this data so that if we ever go offline, they can publish all of this, this data to IBFS or on-chain. Um, so I think this is probably the, 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 the biggest compromise that's made in this design. Um, and there are, there are many alternative solutions that are um, sort of still in development process. Um, what, one option, for example, if we didn't care about privacy, would be to publish all the data as cool data onto the blockchain, which makes it very easy for everyone to always have access to it. Um, but alternatives, um, iterations of this, which would be better in the future, would be, for example, publishing it in an encrypted form, which allows it only to be accessed by those who need to see their own balances. Um, and um, I think th this system has now sort of demonstrated that it's able to handle the throughput uh, the, and, and privacy requirements of serious traders for the first time using a decentralized exchange. But the biggest sort of disadvantage of the system as it stands now is around composability. So the, the, the big draw of most on-chain exchanges um, is the fact that you can, within a single transaction, take a flash loan and trade on one venue and arbitrage between another, uh, all um, within a, a, a single set of trans single set, single transaction, which you can't do with these types of um, uh, rolled up uh, transa tra batch transactions. And so uh, the biggest area that we're currently working on solving and interested to discuss with anyone who, um, who wants to discuss it is around how you can, uh, at the same time, um, link on-chain transactions through, for example, Uniswap with an off-chain trade on Diversify. And there are some proposed ways of doing this. So, for example, um, using a concept of a conditional proof where you design your 
predicate to also include um, saying that or, or, or verifying that, there, that a specific on-chain transaction happened before you made a specific off-chain uh, operation valid. And so when you were then um, generating your proof and verifying it, you would need to see that this on-chain transaction had occurred before you would allow a certain transfer also to occur. Um, and once, um, and yeah, th th these types of um, proofs are certainly theoretically possible, but still more difficult to implement. But I think increasingly, as we see more decentralized exchanges and other applications start to use various types of roll-ups, and particularly ZK roll-ups, it will become much more critical to solve um, this issue if we want to be able to maintain what is currently, I think, the, the biggest draw to DeFi of composability. Um, and in addition, I think the other, the other sort of more minor in the short-term issues are instant withdrawals in that if you wanted to quickly withdraw funds out, you need to wait for a new batch to settle rather than a, a single trade. And also the fact that while this is much more cost-effective than main-chain Ethereum transactions at a high scale, at sub, um, at, at a very low scale, it, it's more expensive. So um, this is a solution which has to be designed for high, high throughput use. Um, and that's something where, in the long run, I think more, more generalized types of um, uh, ZK roll-up systems where you could have other applications using the same proof um, would, would help to solve this issue. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. So, so in the current system that you have now, um, if I submit a transaction, how much time does it take me as a user to process the transaction? I understand that you know you, you prove, so it, it, it takes time to generate the proof, right? So, so if I am submitting a transaction and say this transaction is part of another like hundred transactions per second, how much time does it take now, and how do you see this improving maybe this year? Or, yeah, so at the moment, um, there's no strong requirement to actually generate and submit a proof unless um, there's a withdrawal within it because um, you, you, could, you can instantly keep trading post receiving confirmation that it's included. Um, but to generate a, a batch once it's finalized can take, well, anywhere between uh, sort of one to five minutes depending on how, how much computing so power you put. So, so I, I submit a transaction, and five minutes later, it's 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 finalized, correct? Yes, but with yeah, exactly. But within that period, you could, for example, have bought and sold ten times, and that doesn't affect your trading experience. So, this five minutes, uh, what does it come from? Can you make make it faster? And what does this five minute come from? Yeah, so I mean, this this can be uh, basically this is this can be scaled um, through just extra computing power. So, um, there's no that, that there's no absolute constraint on that. Uh, but time. when you guys release it, it's going to be five minutes because of what? How did you decide to make it five minutes and not like so uh, actually, the real system? Actually, when we release, yeah, I mean, when we release this, it won't be five minutes. It could be much longer. I mean, the, basically, essentially, we will be um, waiting for there to be at least one withdrawal in the batch before submitting, which could then be, for example, an hour. Right, so um, what, what or, are you going to tell or, to the or, users? Or, if I'm a user, or, or when it reaches a certain size. But, but I think because essentially the user experience isn't impacted by that time unless there's a withdrawal included. Um, and if there is, then um, th there's kind of a maximum acceptable time, which really depends on, on, on what the user is doing. OK. So we're running a bit late, so we can have one quick question. Very quickly. So this uh, this was at Finex before, and is it, this is still uh, owned by Bitfinex, or how is it done? And, uh, I don't no, know. Yeah. So um, the original, like um, t some of our team and, and product was launched under Ethfinex as Ethfinex Trustless, uh, but around six months ago we completely separated out, uh, basically to focus purely on scaling. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Another quick question? No? No. Okay. Huh? Okay. That's my question. So how resistant is this to regulatory pressure? So specifically, the committee you mentioned, you know, then 
being uh, arrested all at once suddenly sounds like a fun possibility. Things of that sort. I mean, just operating this out of, out of various jurisdictions. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I absolutely think it's, uh, it's it's vulnerable in the sense that you've said, but not from a customer fund point of view. So customers can always be confident that they can withdraw under any circumstance. But I do I do agree that um, particularly actually some of the aspects of the design, including private transaction trading, will mean that there will be some likely some regulatory interaction necessary. For example, on on some DEXs, for example, our current on-chain version. If there was if there were stolen funds, it's completely traceable to see what the trader did and where they withdrew it to, without needing to come and speak with us as developers or anyone else, which isn't necessarily true with this system. Um, so it's that there are different yeah concerns raised. Which regulatory body governs you or where? Um, so currently, the the organisation Diversify is based in uh, British Virgin Islands. Thanks, that's it. Thank you.